Hello everyone, Bear here, and welcome to a first look at Warhammer Age of Sigma Stormground. This is a turn-based strategy roguelike with elements of squad management included. Now I have to admit straight up that I am a big fan of the original Warhammer fantasy and do hold a lot of grudges against Age of Sigma, but I figure we can ignore the tabletop and just take this on its own merits. Now right from the beginning I do have to point something out that actually was quite strange to me. I always go into the settings and reset the audio for these games, have a little play with them before I start recording anything. And what I noticed was initially all the graphical settings were set to low, as well as frame rate limits being set at 60, which for me is fine, I record these at 60 FPS. However, if you're on a higher frame rate monitor, such as mine, which is actually 144 Hz, you will want to go into your settings straight away and change these, particularly getting those graphical settings off from low. I may only have a simple GTX 1080, but it is definitely capable of doing better than simple low graphical settings. Going through the rest of our options, you'll find them somewhat minimalist, which is absolutely fine, because the most important ones are going to be your audio settings, including subtitles, always a key feature in every game, as well as going into your controls and being able to change these to your preference. So once you've started up and you've changed your settings, getting that graphical fidelity you want, you then have the option of starting a new campaign or entering multiplayer. Well, I'm a single player gamer, so we're really just going to focus on the campaign, but there is a multiplayer option, and you are initially asked, unfortunately wasn't recording, whether you want to agree to sign up for their multiplayer access. But as I said, I'm a single player gamer, let's go ahead and let's take a look at their campaigns. Now you'll notice we have three campaigns we can choose from. We have the Nurglings on the right, we have the Night Haunt, your Undead in the center, and the Stormcast Eternals, the base race for Age of Sigma over on the left. You'll also notice that these are all locked off, meaning we will have to complete our Stormcast Eternals on Warrior difficulty before we can progress to higher difficulties or even have access to these other factions. So when you start these up, you get a lovely little speech giving you just a little bit of information, some of the backstory for these factions, as well as a nice little note here, you shall die in the battles ahead, and that is not just certain, it is expected. Dying is not to fail, but to be reforged to fight again and again. Only war is eternal. And this really does set you up for the idea that this is not a game you're not really going to be wanting to save scum your way through, as you can't really. This is a roguelike, you are meant to fight, you are meant to die, you are meant to try again and again, reforging your forces each time when you enter the realm for a new run. It's a lot more narrative, it's a lot more progressive, you're going to be finding units dying left, right and center, that's absolutely fine. Keep going, let them improve, let the narrative play out how it does. We can also notice though the little bonuses we get for our faction, Stormcast Eternal's Campaign of Warrior Ascension. We'll have a limited starting warband, our revives costing one miracle per squad, and we have a single realm conquest. So a nice little introduction to the game and how the features work. So coming into the battles it starts you off with a nice little tutorial of just how all the features work within the game. Nothing particularly special here, just learning about turn-based combat and how to move the camera. Now what's quite interesting is this is a left click based game. You will left click your character and left click the base, right clicking to actually deselect them. For someone who's very used to left click the character then right click to move, this is going to take a little getting used to but it's nothing too major. A few little notes on the controls, something that it hasn't really gone into if you click your middle mouse button, you can move around the battlefield, and it is a little quicker than moving around using the corners. You can also zoom in and out of the battlefield itself, getting a better look at your units or the enemy as you move around. Now, having been a strategy gamer for a long time, and particularly in RTSs, I'm more used to actually drawing back to have the largest view of the battlefield, but for those of you who want to get in close to the action, it's a nice little inclusion and can help with that immersion a little bit if you're really looking for the roleplay aspects of this game. But then how do the battles work? Well, put simply, it's a turn-based strategy game where you will take turns against your opponent to maneuver your unit, select attacks, select skills and abilities in an effort to either defeat the enemy or complete a specific objective. 
and with every enemy you defeat, you're gaining experience, something that will come into play later on in the game. So just how will you go about conducting combat upon the battlefield? Well, an excellent thing to note is the way that armor works. The more armor you have, the more damage you will reduce coming into your character. Now what's really interesting is the second section here, where if a unit's armor stat is greater or equal to the damage an armor save may trigger, resulting in no damage taken. We also have the greater the difference between the damage and their armor will increase the likelihood of that armor save to occur, meaning it's never a bad thing to keep piling on the armor to prevent any damage to your characters. Now a great thing to know is how these charges work. As is explained here, when you are charging your enemy, aka attacking them, you will get retaliatory damage meaning every time you attack, expect to get an attack back from the enemy, which will have a big impact on how you go about commanding your forces by trying to mitigate their damage taken, taking the enemy out before they can retaliate. Of course, this being a turn-based strategy, it wouldn't really work if you didn't have a range of units available to you. To begin with, if your Stormcast Eternal, you will have access to Castigators. They are a ranged unit attacking enemies from afar and trying to avoid taking that close combat damage themselves. And one of the key features in this game is going to be using your abilities. Noted up here, we have Aether and Abilities. Aether is the resource that you'll be using and will gradually build up over time. Using this resource will allow you to cast abilities, in this case tutorializing challenge, which will prevent the enemy from moving towards your castigators, keeping that unit safe, and bring them in towards Freya instead as she has a much better chance of surviving that opening battle. It should be noted though, there is no way to cancel a move once you have set it. So if you're just wanting to probe an area and figure out whether you can use an ability, uh, that option is completely gone. You'll have to plan this out right from the start, so expect some trial and error in the early stages and some mistakes to come through. I actually think this is the reason they've said expect to die right at the beginning of the game, because if you can't turn back a move, you are going to mess up, you are going to put things in the wrong place. It is an annoyance, but it does build into that narrative and I can't really fault them for doing it. When completing each mission, you will be awarded with the spoils of war. And this is something really worth talking about, but we'll get into this in more detail later on. Not only are you going to win new characters, new equipment, as you progress and complete different missions, as you progress in the campaign and complete your missions, you're also going to gain lore rewards. This will give those of you who are new to Age of Sigmar and Warhammer in general, some really nice information of the background and the world building that's gone into this franchise. Of course, you'll also gain experience for your characters, being that as with most things, the end level loot section really is the best part. Between each mission, you will be able to look at a quasi-animated backdrop with some beautiful artwork depicting your journey through the campaign as well as making it clear which battles are available, what the enemy warband will entail, the difficulty of that mission, and the rewards available to you. When starting a mission, you'll be able to select the spawning point of your units, essentially acting as a deployment phase, giving you a chance to start to consider your tactics and the battlefield right from the very start. Now a good thing to note here is that your hero will come for free, but after that you'll need to spend power based upon the mission itself in order to summon the additional units of your warband. Any unspent power will be converted into Aether, meaning you can still gain when you don't use it, However, it will be the limiting factor in deciding how many and what units you will bring to the battlefield. We can see here we have three power on this unit of castigators, so bringing them would actually deplete our entire power reserve. Something that at the start really isn't an issue, but it will be something to note as you move on in the campaign and gain access to stronger and stronger units. And this mission really does a great job of tutorializing the effect the environment will have upon your units. Moving over to raised ground, we can see a minus one movement when moving up to this elevation. We'll also see an increase to the range of our skirmishers. Now what's actually very cool about the way this game is set up is you don't only have war chests. This giving you access to those spoils of war 
but also a lore cache. You will have to decide whether you want to learn more about, in this case, the ancient scrolls of Shaish, or if you just need that equipment. Now, as someone who adores the lore of Warhammer, I would actually say the lore cache is more important, but I can understand the consideration will need to go into this as you progress in the game. Now, you gain these simply by walking atop them, so you don't have to worry about giving up an action in order to open up these chests. So it does really help that pace of the game. Now once claiming this equipment, as is pretty standard for these type of games, you won't actually be able to equip it or set anything until after the mission is finished. But it does mean going into your next missions, progressing through into the story, you will have better and better equipment, more and more options available to you and your squad, developing them and constructing them to whatever best suits your preferences. But of course, the real strategic component to our battle and the real challenge for players is going to be in using your abilities. And a great thing to note is that you can chain these in this game. You can use multiple abilities working between different characters, incorporating enemy models and incorporating the environment, all to great effect in your battles. By using Freya and her Hammer Slam ability, we were able to knock back these Blade Guys Revenants into the second unit, causing damage to both. Now combos and chaining isn't something new to turn-based strategy, but it's always nice to see the classics done well. And it's a very small thing, but I do like the fact that the game doesn't automatically end your turn even though all your units have moved as much as they can. It just gives you a little bit of a break, a little bit of a pause, and given how in turn-based strategy, the player kind of sets the pace, at least in terms of battle progression, it's a nice little way just to introduce that extra bit of time to plan things through, to think about how the enemy is going to retaliate to you before you actually progress into their turn and watch all hell break loose. And that isn't to say that all turn-based strategies are slow, in fact this game actually does a very good job of moving their units at a reasonable pace. Often in turn-based strategies, the AI will take so long to move their units, you can get up, go make a cup of coffee, come back, and it probably still won't be your turn yet. Something that I haven't come across on this, at least not yet within the campaign. Now as we can see at the beginning of this mission, we actually now need 4 power to recruit these units. Meaning we're going to have to wait a little bit until we can summon the rest of our forces onto the battlefield. Power will gradually increase over the course of a battle, meaning you will be able to draw in units as the battle progresses, but you'll have to have a little think about when you want them to come in for the greatest effect. With our environmental advantages, we also have specialist features. In this map, we have a wellspring. Capturing this will allow us to gain bonus ether at the start of each turn, meaning we can use more and more of our abilities throughout the match, giving us a good advantage on the enemy and really drilling in the tactical component of the game. It's also good to note that your units will suffer from summoning sickness. Once summoned, you will have to end turn before you can begin to move them. So don't just drop them in the middle of the enemy unless you're preset with some good retaliatory abilities so as not simply to get wasted in your opening turn. And though you will be able to go back and fight these battles again, you'll find the battlefields have changed, objectives have changed, and you actually are forced to play a little differently. So having abandoned our run and moved them back to the start, we now have to refight these battles that we can see that our enemy has changed. And this reflects the fact that your warband has increased in strength, meaning that each run will be a challenge. Even if you start from the beginning, you are going to struggle to make your way back forth. Though something I did wish they explained a little better as I had wanted to start once more from the beginning to record for this video. So it's good to note that the progress of the game will continue regardless of what you do. You can have multiples of the same units, of course as you progress in the game the likelihood is you'll end up with one of each type of unit as more units become available, but also allowing you to focus each unit into a specific playstyle, allowing you to pick skills and equipment that will focus in on a specific ability. Something that will become extremely important as the game progresses. But this is the real section we're after. For strategy gaming fans, particularly if you're into squad management, here's where you're going to have the most fun. You will always have to have a hero unit within your army, occupying the top slot no matter what you do. But you'll then be able to select and customize the rest of your forces going into each mission. As well as accumulating resources such as tribute and miracles to help you out in your battles. 
Now a good thing to know are these different abilities here. Red represents your ability to attack the enemy, yellow represents your defense and armor from the enemy, green representing your health, and blue representing your movement. All of these can be changed by skills and equipment that you will acquire throughout your play. And each unit will bring their own focus of abilities to keep each unit unique. All of your skills and equipment will be increased by gaining new spoils of war as you progress through the campaign. But atop this, you will also gain those spoils of lore. And these spoils of lore will come complete with their own fully voiced narration, giving you something great to listen into while you're just having a little ponder. Now unfortunately they will not continue playing when you leave the lore screen, meaning you can't actually listen into the audio as you're setting up your units. A little thing that I think the game really missed out on as organizing your troops, selecting their war gear can take quite a bit of time, and being able to just listen into some lore while you're doing it would have been a really nice and quite enjoyable way to do such a simple task. So if that's what you're going to get, then let's have a quick look at one of these warbands and see exactly what this game is about. We have access to four different types of units. We have Freya, of course, now wielding a massive two-handed hammer. Our castigators with some additional effects on them, causing bleed whenever they fire at the enemy. Our liberators about to get a nice little upgrade. And our first introduction of Vanguard Hunters, a brand new unit to our forces. So let's go ahead and upgrade these. We have no upgrades we can give to our Liberator's weaponry, we do have a nice little increase to their armor, giving them an extra health of a brand new shield. Something that you should know is denoted down here by nice little pluses and minuses to make clear what effect this is having, even though they haven't actually tutorialized any of this. Which really does speak to the UI, showing that you can declare to the player what to do by simple things like changing the color on the window and having little areas light up to know exactly what is new and what you can do for your units. Allowing us to get the skill Resilient Charge, giving us a better defense against charge and a plus one heal when doing so. Well, this is our warband for now. We have one miracle to our name. Let's go ahead and start. So after a little bit of playing, we've been able to unlock some of the later stage equipment. Our miracles now running up to three, you will gain these throughout play. These are what will allow you to bring your units back to life after they have fallen. You see that you retain your units moving between runs. You can only keep and select few going with you each time. In this case, just two extra units. So buffing up your main character is really going to be where it counts. And getting those units that you particularly prefer to stay with you each time is going to be very important. We also have some extra special spells. These are once more you can take with you between your runs. In this case, we have the Cycle of Souls, giving us a really nice bonus on the battlefield and something that's going to be seriously important as you're reaching the end of this campaign, the final battle being particularly difficult. You also unlock our lovely custom army painter when you're in single player, so you can have a little fun with that as you're moving around as well. I've got to say, it doesn't take long getting past the tutorialization section, which will unlock the Nighthawk and Maggotkin of Nurgle factions to play in the campaign giving you that variation, requiring some play, but not so long as to be annoying. Though it should be noted, the Night Haunt and Maggotkin of Nurgle factions do take a little more consideration when playing, so I wouldn't really move on to them until you're comfortable with the basics of the game and understand how the flow of battle works. So if that's your campaign, let's, let's bite the bullet, let's take a look at our multiplayer options. To begin with, you will be able to select your faction to your preference meaning you can play the campaigns, learn the different units before picking your favorite and trying them in multiplayer matches. Now for me, in the original Warhammer Fantasy, I was a huge fan of vampire counts, which unfortunately are not represented, closest being these undead night haunts, but given the choice, I'd still rather go Nurgle. So aside from selecting your warband, we have our standard spoils of war available to us and improve them as you progress in your multiplayer career increasing their skills, changing their war gear, and changing the units themselves. But let's face facts, an entire army of Nurglings is really all you need. The big one though is taking a look at our army painter. Now you can create your own design, customizing these characters however you like to make them just a little bit more unique to you and your playstyle. Now Nurgle isn't particularly good for this sort of thing, and though the Nighthorns definitely have a bit more variance in them, I really think they've chosen some armies that don't particularly lend themselves to this sort of customization. 
In fact, I really think the only army that benefits from this is going to be the Stormcast Eternal. You can have a lot of fun really customizing these characters and getting them to look however you want. But if I wanted to play as Space Marines, then we'd be playing 40k. So let's go back and stick with our Nurgle forces. So you can hit auto match and play against an enemy from anywhere around the world at any time. Currently, we have an average wait time of 14 seconds, which, given this is the first day of the release, is actually pretty impressive with 40 odd players in the game. And I'm not joking, it's the 27th of May at half 12, and we already have a multiplayer scene within the game. Now, we can tailor this multiplayer mode to our own design. We can auto match against anyone, we can play with friends if we want to and spread that nurgly goodness or we can come over and battle against the AI. We then have a selection of maps you can go through, and we're going to pick one that's a little bit different. The key thing we're looking at here is some of the inclusions on the battlefield. So let's get ready to go to Fungal Cliffs in the Soul Prison. And we're just going to set all our units in with plenty of reinforcements, and begin our practice match. Now within this game, there are multiple different terrain types. We can see here we have a wellspring of power, which will allow us to gather power as we progress, as well as a wellspring of ether, once more allowing us to gather ether as we progress each turn. We also have soul prisons, and destroying this soul prison will defeat the enemies in this area. They're pretty well armored and have plenty of HP, so we'll definitely be reaching into those reinforcements as we progress. We have plenty of raised terrain kicking around, but we also might be able to knock the enemy off the map. So let's go ahead and summon our hero and start this match. And we've moved on to the Guy Ran Fisher. Now the reason I've done this is I really wanted to show that the environment actually has a serious consideration in the battlefield, meaning that this minus two damage on entry, minus one damage per turn where there, we might be able to knock enemies onto this and actually wipe them out. There are some terrain features that will instantly kill an enemy, so keep your eye out for them as the battles progress, as they can give you a massive advantage over your foe. And welcome back to a brand new battle map, this time going up against the Stormcast Eternal and just checking out some of the things available to us. So I will say going into these battles against the AI, I honestly wouldn't expect that much from them in a skirmish. Maybe once you've upgraded them a bit or really tried to give them as much advantage as possible, they could actually do a little something with it. But as it stands, they tend to just throw their hero at you, giving you some pretty easy victories early on. And what we saw here is a brilliant use of environmental damage. By knocking the enemy off the edge of the map, we automatically defeated them, and since it was the hero, we automatically win. As I said, the AI is not the best at organizing their forces, so I would imagine in multiplayer people aren't going to be quite so nice in giving their hero up for a free kill. But it's still a great little thing to consider, using the environment to your advantage, maybe trying to combine some of those attacks, slowly knocking them and pulling them around before you can deal that final blow. Now since this was an AI battle, we didn't gain any war gear, we didn't gain any skills, but going on to multiplayer, all of that will play a much deeper part. So at the end of that, I hope it's given you some idea as to just what to expect if you were to pick up Warhammer Age of Sigmar Stormground. It's a lovely little squad based turn based strategy with plenty of unit management available to keep you invested in those units as you progress and really giving the game a nice bit of life in its persistence. And if you want to see any more of this, I am going to be playing the main campaigns over on Twitch so you can always pop in for a go or check here on YouTube as they slowly make their way over. But either way, it's been lovely having you, I hope this has helped, and as always, peace out.